Hey. I'll be real brief. Um, so just so you know, tonight's event will be uh, recorded, and so you have audio and video on the KPCC website. Uh, it is not a podcast, but it is on the website. I don't know how it, technical terms. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so before we get started, thank yous. Uh, as always, the Rose Bowl board, we have an excellent board of directors that has been so active and helpful with all of this stuff behind the scenes. So thank you to the board. Um, all of the Rose Bowl parents and players uh, in attendance tonight and all the uh, parents who have helped to make this event possible. Tina Thompson helping with uh, publicity. Um, John Cohn and Jenny Smith here at, at the Crawford um, room. Bill Davis, president of uh, Southern California Public Radio, who's not here but uh, allowed us to use this great room for this event. And then, of course, my dad. Um, so recently, my wife, Camille, um, she um, inter did an interview with my dad on KPCC on off-ramp, and some of the parents in the program heard it and uh, approached me and mentioned how it had affected them. And um, for the first time, I began to think that maybe there would be more people who are interested in hearing the story. Um, although I generally try to keep public and private life separate, um, it just seemed like the right time maybe that, that uh, to have my dad come and speak to the group. So, because um, this group really means a lot to me. So, um, this is something that I'm happy to share. Um, this is not a means, honestly, to motivate any team in any upcoming competition or anything like that. Um, although, you know, it's, it, it's a lot more important than that. You know, we, we do our thing athletically out there and we compete hard and, and uh, this really goes above that. Although, of course, there are parallels in athletics to the, uh, to the story that you're going to hear, you know. Um, in fact, one of my coaches when I was growing up who knew about my dad's story said to me, you know, and during difficult training set, just think of what Leon was going through. And <clears throat> it helped because it, it doesn't really compare to what we experience uh, to today in our, in our program. Um, the simple reason for tonight's event is to provide another opportunity for more people to hear my father's story. The more people who hear it, the less likely that something like this can occur again in the future. Okay, um, he's going to speak for a little bit over an hour, and then afterwards we will open up the floor to questions, and um, we will use this wireless mic, and someone will be walking around holding the mic for people who have questions. Okay, and now I'd like to introduce my dad, Leon Lason. Too much lights. Uh, <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Daniel, for a wonderful introduction. Um, that's probably the best introduction I've had in many of occasions that I spoke, uh, except for this one. I, I'll tell you about that. But yours were close. <laughs> <laughs> I got to keep them down, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm, you know, I'm not a public speaker, so, and I, and I, I guess you already know, I've spoken in many places, on many different occasions. And one time, and I'm, since not being a public speaker, somebody asked me how I want to be introduced. And I just said, well, you know, just tell, Tell the audience that um, I survived the Holocaust. Tell them my name that I survived the Holocaust. And uh, they had, I had, I, when I came to this country, I became a teacher, and I taught for 39 years in the Los Angeles Unified School District. So he got up and said, uh, here is Leon Lason. He survived the Holocaust and 39 years of the LA Unified School District. <laughs> Uh, actually, the 39 years of uh, LA Unified was uh, my best years of my life. That's where I met my wife, that's why I, uh, I had my career. And so, I, um, 
Go, I'm going to tell you. You know, I'm not a public. I'm not a. I'm not any anything. I I, I keep saying I'm not a public speaker, and I'm not a researcher, and I'm not. I haven't done any research in the Holocaust. But I experienced it. So I'm going to tell you about my experience during that period of time. That of my experience and that of my family. And so to start to begin with, so you'll know where I came from. I came from a small town in northeastern Poland called Narewka. You don't know where it is, huh? Well, nobody in Poland knows where it is either. <laughs> Uh, it's a very tiny town. Uh, it's not even a dot on the map. There, there were maybe uh, there was a little town of a population of maybe 2,000, half Jews, half non-Jews. And for the most part, during my period of time living there, uh, things were quite amicable, you know. We got along pretty well. Um, but during my parents' time, earlier, uh, as you probably know, about the pogroms, you know what that means, and uh, many, many uh, people left that area because of those uh, riots and came to this country in the early 1900s. But during my period of time, it was peaceful. We got along. My father had a job. He was a craftsman. There was one factory in the in this whole town, and uh, he was the only uh, tool and die maker in this company. And then when the company moved to a place called Krakow, which probably you know about, Krakow is a big city in su southern Poland. And so they asked him to transfer. He transferred, and then uh, after a few years after he established himself, he brought the rest of his family to Krakow. So in 1938, uh, we picked up our family, left our little hometown where, you know, my, my experiences were wonderful. I had, uh, you know, I was running barefoot in the summer and we had a river and we swim naked in the in the river and skated on it in the winter and all that it was a pretty good kind of life you know very secure and, and so we left and went to Krakow to the big city and this was for me it, coming from that small town it was uh, like coming to Disneyland you know that was the first time I've seen I saw a house that was built it was taller than one story, and wasn't made of wood. This this one, the city was beautiful. Uh, you probably know about it because Krakow is one of those places you go to when you go to Eastern Europe and visit Eastern European cities. You go to places like Budapest and um, Vienna, maybe, and Krakow, because Krakow is a used to be the capital of Poland when Poland was a kingdom. So it was a great place to come. It had all kinds of monuments and parks and uh, it was a beautiful place and I was looking forward to a really wonderful life in the city of Krakow. In my family there were five, five children. I was the youngest and so uh, counting down from the oldest to the youngest there were it was my oldest brother Herschel, and then my brother Salik, then my brother, my sister Aviva, and then my brother David and me. So we all came to Krakow. And as I said, it, for me it was just like coming to Disneyland. I saw all these wonderful things, and I was looking forward to a really wonderful life. I started school, and um, got acquainted with uh, some friends and uh, you know we had uh, for me uh, the streetcars on the, on, the, on the city of Krakow were something really marvelous things you know they I've never seen anything like that in my hometown if you want to go somewhere you had to have a horse and wagon you didn't you didn't have a streetcar it ran all by itself and so 
after I got some friends, after a few weeks I got a few friends and we, we would venture out a little further and further into the city and um, the streetcars had platforms on both ends. You People could get on it on either end. And in this inside the streetcar there was a man who sold tickets and he went back and forth. They had a pouch and he sold tickets to people who got on. And we would watch to see where he was and we would get on the platform that's as far away from him as we could. And then we'd go a few stops. And then we, when he got really close, we'd get off and get on the other end and go a few more stops. You know, we just were kids. We were, it's, it was wonderful. It was great. And it was parks and all these other things that, you know, in a big city, and Krakow had a castle. It was a kingdom when, uh, when it was a capital when Poland was a kingdom. So it has kings and monuments of very ki various kinds, and it has a castle and so on. In any case, uh, so Lyme was beginning to look good, and um, I was looking to a wonderful future in the big city. A year later. Germany invaded Poland, and everything changed. I went from a boy looking forward to a wonderful life in the city of Krakow to an enemy of a state. Imagine, I was 10 years old, I was the enemy of, of Germany, and Germany couldn't be a, a wonderful uh, state without my being dead. But that was not obvious at the time, you know, in, in retrospect we know, we know all this, but uh, at the time, I'll just give you an idea how gradually they worked into this. They began their campaign against the Jewish people immediately by various small uh, restrictions. So, some of the restrictions were nothing, you know, it was simple. For example, um, the wonderful parks, uh, they had a sign that said, uh, one day they put a sign up and said that Jews who go to the parks are not permitted to sit on the benches. You know, I was 10 years old, I didn't pay much attention to that, and neither did anybody else. And my parents, you know, my par people my parents' age remember the Germans from World War I. They occupied Poland for four years, and uh, they didn't pick on any particular group of people. And when the war was over, they left, and that was that. So they expected these Germans to be the same. And so these restrictions were something you have to put up with, as my mother would say, and during wartime you have to put up with these, uh, these kind of things. And so, uh, first uh, we couldn't sit on the benches, and then another sign went up, Jews are not allowed to go to the parks altogether. And in order to go to the, in the city from one end, of, from one part of the city to another, you have to go past some of these parks, so we had to have these security routes to to go someplace because you not are not allowed to go to the park. But I really didn't much pay much attention to it. I was 10 years old. I went to the park when I wanted to, you know, I just didn't pay much attention to it. But the restrictions became even more, uh, you know, ever more severe. Um, for example, um, oh, my favorite streetcars. At first they had a, a a rope strung in the middle of the streetcar, and it said on the side, it actually said a big sign that said, Für Juden, für nicht Juden, meaning for Jews and for non Jews. So Jews had to get in the back, non Jews in the front. They spoiled our game because they had the rope in the middle. <laughs> But then uh, the rope went down and the sign went up and it said Jews are not allowed to take public transportation, period, altogether. Couldn't use any public transportation. Step by step by step. My father lost his job right at the beginning of the war. Um, 
and he got arrested, and he was in jail for several months for no reason. For no reason, just some patrolman coming through our street, to, you know, found out that there's a Jewish family there. They just came in the house and arrested my father. And we didn't know where he was for several months. And so um, when he came back after a couple of months, he, he lost his job. And about just about the same time, a young uh, German officers who distinguished themselves in the German service came to Krakow to make money came to Krakow to make money because it was a good place to come. Jewish property was being confiscated and it was given to these people. And uh, so uh, a man who um, came and uh, got a little factory to run called Emalia, they made pots and pans, enamel works, little dinky little company that made enamel kitchenware and this man was given this factory to run it turned out to be Oscar Schindler when he found out that there's a craftsman in the area and he didn't have a job my father he hired him because the factory happened to be the, Sch the Schindler factory happened to be right across the street from my father's pre-war job and he was known in the area and when Schindler found out about him he hired him it wasn't for money, but eventually, uh, later on, it turned out it was a great advantage to have a job. And so it went, step by step. First, we couldn't go to the parks. First, we couldn't sit on the benches. Then we couldn't go to the parks. First, we had to sit in the back of the streetcars. Then we couldn't take public transportation altogether. I was not allowed to go to school. That's the first thing I found out. Jewish kids were not allowed to go to school. And I'll just admit to you that uh, for a few minutes or a couple of days, I thought that was a good thing. Hey, no school, you know? But I want you to know that there's a difference between getting up one morning and getting a be a, being a little lazy and maybe having a little tummy ache and you don't want to go to school and that's one thing but to not be allowed to go to school that's a whole nother thing and so it went no school for me or my brothers and sister and um, Little by little, they were marginalizing the Jewish people. First, we couldn't do this, then we couldn't do that. Then we had to provide a certain number of hours of la free labor, cleaning streets and chopping ice and shoveling snow and things like that. All of that was just taken as something we had to put up with during wartime. No one expected this civilized country of Germany to do what they were going to do. And so, step by step, they, be, they continued their marginalization of the Jewish people until, you know, first we couldn't do this, then we couldn't do that, we couldn't, you know, we were being separated from the rest of the population. And then eventually, we had to wear armbands if we went out in the street, Jews had to wear an armband to identify them as Jews. And that's another thing. You know, if you want to identify yourself by your religious preference, it's great. That's fine. You wear a cross, or you wear a Star of David, or you wear a half moon, or whatever else you wear, you know, you just, you could do whatever you like. In this country, we celebrate this. But to be identified yourself 
to have to identify yourself by your Jewish, you know, by your religion. That's a different thing. There's a purpose in that. And so it, and just so you'll know, this, pro this process actually worked. Even some of my father's friends who came to Krakow at the same time that he did because of when the factory moved, all, his, all the employees from the factory were asked to transfer. They all came and they, they all, you know, they're all buddies together. We lived close together and all that. But little by little they began to kind of distance themselves from us. Not, you know, that, so we could notice, but they were not as, kind of not as friendly. Somehow we are, we became the other. And so in those, that was not enough after this process of marginalizing us as, as a different group of people. They also decided that we couldn't live among the rest of the population. First, we couldn't do things that the rest of the population did. Now we couldn't live where the rest of the population lived. And so they, they put up um, high walls around a small area in the city of Krakow. And um, forced the non-Jews to leave, and Jews had to move in. This is the Krakow ghetto. It was a small area, and we were jammed in tight, really close. So right immediately, as soon as we were uh, locked into this ghetto, you know the. It was guarded 24 hours a day. You couldn't get out, you couldn't get in. They didn't allow very many provisions in. And the uh, shortages of food began in Poland immediately after the invasion, after the Germans invaded Poland because they helped themselves to Polish wealth and shipped it to Germany. So there were shortages of food already generally in, in Poland, but in the ghetto, it was even worse because they only allowed so many provisions in. And uh, so my, my memory of this place was that, you know, I was just 12 years old. I spent two years in that place. And for the two years, I don't ever remember not being hungry. I always, I was always hungry. I was always scrounging around for food somewhere. I was always doing something to get a slice of bread, uh, carry something for somebody, or do something, or, so, or sweep, or clean, or whatever was available so I could get a, something to eat. It's very difficult to, to explain being hungry the two years in the ghetto, you know, uh, I get hungry today, like everybody else, like between breakfast and lunch. But I'm not worried because the refrigerator is full of food, and I can get food whenever I want to. So if I don't get it now, I'll get it later. But in those days, there was no such thing. We didn't have any place where there was food just waiting for me to to get. It's always looking. It's always gone. It was always consumed and then uh, always looking for more. So my memory of the ghetto was I was always hungry and I was always scared. Because in the ghetto, those people who operated the ghetto were trained to treat us as uh, subhuman, and so they, they treated us that way. So, you know, it wasn't unusual for somebody to get uh, beaten up for not getting off the sidewalk to let some soldier go by, or even be killed. You got beaten, you got lucky. So be besides being hungry, I was scared all the time. I was always frightened. I was always worried about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
and there were many wrong places to be in. You could go around the corner one day and everything was fine, the next day somebody got killed at this corner, you know, so you don't want to go there again. It just, life was like that. It's very difficult to describe the life in the ghetto. When um, the ghetto was established, that was in 1941, about the same year, they actually, Germany invaded the rest of Eastern Europe. You know, the first two years after the first invasion, uh, the Russians, the Soviet Union, occupied the southern part of Poland. And so my hometown was occupied by the Russians until 1941. In 1941, when they invaded the rest of uh, Eastern Europe, as you probably know from history, they went through that area so fast that, you know, they just couldn't keep up with it. They ended up in front of Stalingrad and Leningrad and uh, Moscow, and, you know, they covered that whole area quickly. And behind the invading armies, they sent special troops. And their job was to uh, go through these, home, these small towns like, like mine, of which there were many in, the, in those areas, in those southern part of the, uh, Europe, is to find Jews and murder them. And this was the only assignment. Can you imagine a battalion of soldiers who has one order, go find these, go through these hometowns, these towns, these little towns in, like mine, and murder the Jews. And so, two months after that second invasion, they went, they came through my hometown, where my, the rest of my family, extended family, lived, surrounded it, drove the Jewish people out of their homes, down to the edge of the forest, which was nearby, and murdered the men that day. And the women and children were held in the barn for several more days, and they too disappeared. As a result of the one action of this one battalion of soldiers, everyone who was related to us in Poland, other than those of us who were in the ghetto at the time, in Krakow, died. That includes my oldest brother, who originally escaped the first invasion and ended up with his grandparents on the Soviet side until 1941. And he got caught in that roundup and he too was murdered. The oldest, my oldest brother was 21 at the time. This was all not known to us at the time because the, we had no communications with, the, uh, with my family in uh, my hometown. Can you imagine battalions of soldiers and their job is to find, go through these hometowns, these, these little towns. Uh, I call them hometowns because they were there were so many of them. This is called this is called the, in case you you don't know this, it's called the Pale of Settlement. So there were many, many, many towns like mine whose where Jews settled. And so um, I once told a, a reporter who was interview me and wanted to know about this and I told her about uh, the battalions of soldiers who roamed the eastern part of Europe and murdered Jews by shooting them. And when she wrote the article, when it came out, it said Italian soldiers did this. So I don't say battalion of soldiers anymore. <laughs> I have to say Back in, back in Krakow, after they 
they roamed the eastern part. You know, we were it was unknown to us. After they they roamed the eastern part of uh, Poland and and Russia and the Belarus and murdered people with by these battalions of soldiers. The Germans decided that these things were not going fast enough. And besides that, bullets are too expensive. So uh, with good technology, with good German science, they devised ways of murdering people en masse. Less ex cheaper, less expensive, by gassing them and burning them. So they built factories for, for this purpose. They're called death camps. So there were many of them in, the, in the Poland where these death camps were built. And so they began to transport people out of the ghettos to these death camps. You know, that part of Poland, that part of the history where they um, soldiers were murdering Jews by shooting them and burying them in common graves was known, is not n now known as the Holocaust by bullets. And here, now we're into Holocaust by gas chambers. And so the first transport that was formed, uh, the Nazis announced, we were in, in Krakow at the time in the ghetto, they announced that um, there was going to be a, a train on the, at the railroad station and um, anybody who wants to get on it is welcome to get on. And then those people who got on the train would, would be taken to the countryside and then where they would get fresh air and jobs and food and also alleviate the congestion in the ghetto, which was considerable, which made good sense, except for one little thing. Uh, they were going to, not going to get fresh air at the end of the line, they were going to be gassed and burned. So when that first transport went out, no one, in the, even inside the ghetto, had any notion that there were these death camps until some time later. But little by little, the word came back that there's something very strange happening in the forests out there in the Poland and then people, the trains are going in and, and coming out empty and then another train goes in and it comes out empty and so on. Pretty soon the word finally came back to us and we, we had a very difficult time accepting the idea that this country of uh, musicians composers and philosophers and science, wonderful uh, high culture in Central Europe would actually do this. So it took a while for us, for it to sink in. But it did, eventually. And so they meant they went they had transport after transport, then they rounded up people in Krakow and sent them to these uh, death camps. During that period of time, my father, worked, who worked in Schindler's company, had a permit to leave the ghetto to go to work. So here's where he had this advantage to uh, working in Schindler's company. He would go to work and then on the way home, before he would leave, he would he left some some of his possessions with uh, one of his uh, buddies from before, before the war and asked him to trade it for food and then he would smuggle it in, in his pockets, you know, little slices of bread, some pieces, some potatoes, every, whatever. And in the meantime, Schindler was uh, 
hiring more Jews, more, more Jewish workers. And so uh, my father asked Schindler to add my brother to this, to this uh, company, and he did. So my brother also went to work in Schindler's company, my brother David, who is two years older than I. And he too would smuggle something in his pockets on the way home. And this is how we live from day to day, just scrounging around. Um, and my mother would cook up something, that she, you know, just to give an idea of the shortages of it in the ghetto. You know, Poland, in Poland, uh, in the wintertime, it gets cold. And so if you're going to heat a room, you have to burn something. And so if you're locked up like we were in a ghetto, you could burn your furniture, whatever there was left, and then, then it was, that was over. And so my father used to smuggle in little pieces of coal in his pockets from the factory. The factory used coal for, to melt the enamel, and so uh, he would smuggle some pieces of coal in his pockets, and that was like a precious thing. There, there would, uh, we had, uh, we were sharing our, uh, our bedroom with another couple, and uh, the man from, would then, he would be in charge of the lighting the stove and, and keeping the fire going, and he would sit there in front of the fire, and he, that, that was his most pleasant, pleasurable thing to do, you know. But the Nazis continued with their campaign, and um, more and more transports were being rounded up in the ghetto, in the Krakow ghetto. And each time, each time my uh, my father had a permit to to leave because he was in the work in works in the Schindler's company, and so did my brother, and my sister as well. My sister had a, got a job in a factory called Kabelwerk. And she too got a, went to work in in, a, in this company, and then eventually went to live there. And so, um, just to give an idea about Oscar Schindler, during some of his these roundups, one time he warned his employees, his Jewish employees, not to go back to the to the ghetto because there was going to be a roundup. And he, of course, he knew about it, so he told them not to go back. And so they stayed in the factory overnight and survived this, the roundup. Um, that was just the beginning of some of the Schindler uh, activities during that period. Once the ghetto, you know, so many transports were removed out of the ghetto to these uh, death camps, and they um, decided to close the ghetto and move everybody from the ghetto into uh, Plashov, a concentration camp they had built not far from Krakow, walking distance. And so they, um, by that, at that point, my my father and my brother were, were already living there because they, those who worked in companies like Schindler's and my sister who worked in a Kabelwerk all went to work, live in this camp. And uh, my mother and I were in the, in the uh, in the ghetto, all the last ones, the two of us. Considering during that period, they, uh, they announced that um, everyone is going to be transferred to, uh, to the Plaszow concentration camp and everyone should uh, line up in front of the gate according to the places where they worked. You know, where they had these different companies or different workshops, workstations where people worked. And uh, they would line up and then, then be escorted uh, from the plash, from a uh, Krakow ghetto to the plash of camp. And so uh, my mother lined up with her group and I lined up with mine. I had a, a group I worked 
finally got a job in a brush factory, so I lined up with the brush factory people. And, and um, when my group started to move, and we got to just about where, you no, know, it was just about halfway through the gate, half of the group was about halfway through, and there was a guard standing there, and he saw me, he pulled me out and said, you come later. Well, by that time, I, I didn't think that was such a good thing. But my friends my age and, and my size, you know, we were all pretty little. We round, you know, we tried to figure out what to do. So we huddled up in the back where people were still lining up with their groups and try to figure out what to do because they were not being allowed out either. So um, they decided they were going to go hide because um, we'd hidden once before and we escaped one of the transports. So they thought they were going to do that again. But um, I decided not to. They went go to go and hit in the hiding and I decided not to so I lined up with another group that was leaving I just joined another group you know they had they had no idea whether I belonged to the brush makers or the shoemakers you know I just kept going and uh, I got kept the guard kept pulling me out and one time the guard wasn't looking and I made it out of the ghetto and I made it into this plush of concentration camp and I'm telling you, this is like coming, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire. When I got there, you know, the first the barbed wire and dog, dogs barking and people yelling and, and uh, it was just chaos and it was so, it's such a, strange place. I've never seen a place like that with barracks all as far as the eye could see. And to me, it looked like that was the last stop. From there, I wasn't going to go anywhere. And so I spent a little time in this camp. In the meantime, Schindler, who had uh, quite a few people working for him by this time, uh, persuaded the authorities to let him build a sub-camp so that his employees could live right next to the factory. They wouldn't have to be uh, escorted every day back and forth. You know, uh, it, he was able to persuade the authorities by bribing them, by spending a lot of some, a lot of some of the money that he's made. Uh, and he was able to accomplish it. So he had a camp built. And my father and my brother went to live there. And then um, a few months later, Schindler was going to add more people to his factory because now he had a sub camp with barracks that you know he could accom you know accommodate quite a few more people. So he was hiring. Now this group of people was going to hire had to be from the camp, from the concentration camp. And so um, there was a list made up of people who were going to be transferred. So my mother was on the list and I was on the list and uh, we were going to be transferred from this concentration camp which was, I can't even describe to you, but I give you, I'll give you, just give you an idea that every morning we would come out, you know, line up according to our barracks on this uh, assembly area, and these Nazis would roam the ranks. Sometimes they would beat people up, sometimes they would kill somebody, and every morning it was still dark, you could hear somebody yelling because they're being beaten, and somebody being shot, you know, the shots fired here and there. And they just randomly went through the ranks and just picking on people whenever they felt like it. That was an occurrence every 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 morning. Well, I was on the list and my mother was on the list, and so we were going to be transferred out of this horrible place. And um, a couple of days before the, the we were supposed to uh, 
you know, line up in front of the gate to be escorted out of the camp to Schindler's company, I discovered that my name was crossed off the list. And then I was not going to go. Now I, um, I tried to find out why, but nobody would pay much attention to me. I was a little guy, you know. They just said, well, you know, you, they restarted the brush factory that you, you know, that where you worked in the, in the uh, ghetto, so uh, you, you have a job here, so you can't go. But that was just an excuse. Somebody just crossed my name off and put somebody's name instead. In any case, on the day that they, you know, I was pretty well resigned to the fact that my mother is leaving and I was going to be left alone in this concentration camp. If that had happened, I would not have survived the war. But uh, on the day they were leaving, I just stuck away from my job and I went to see my mother off. I was just a, a kid, I was a boy. And uh, for some reason, as I was walking across this, this uh, camp, uh, it was a long, quite a distance, and nobody saw me, I guess, and nobody bothered me. They just let me go. It looked like I, I was invisible or something. In any case, I ended up in front where the group was, at the gate, and I could hear my mother talking, I could hear the people talking, and uh, I can't even tell you the last few steps that I took, but I found myself in front of this Nazi officer, a real big, brutal guy, when I stood right in front of him, uh, straight up, I could see his belt buckle, you know, about, about that size, nasty looking guy. Um, and I told him, my name, and I told him that my name was on the list and somebody crossed my name off. And then, as like, like a dumb kid, I said to him, um, my mother's on the list and she's in this group. Then I said, now that's really dumb. Then I said, my father and my brother are there already. You know, I was talking to this person who probably didn't think I was a human being and I'm telling you about my family, my father, my brother. But I don't know what happened. He looked at the uh, list, they had, had the assistant show him the list. He looked at it, so my name crossed out. He looked at me, and he just grunted, like, you know, like that. So I jumped in the group, and I, I, I understood that he wanted me to get into this group. So I jumped in and stood there, which seemed like a long time, uh, but uh, it probably wasn't. The gate was opened, and the group started to move, and I got through the gate, and I could breathe. This is how I ended up on Schindler's List and Schindler's Company. So when we arrived in Schindler's Company, they took us into the factory and showed us some places to work and uh, gave each person a chance to try out different uh, workstations and they tried me out on one workstation and I could do whatever they showed me to do so they said okay this is your job but I was pretty little it, that was a, it's a metal lathe and uh, I don't know if you know what that is it it cuts metal that spins you know kind of round it Anyway, um, so I was operating this machine, but I was so short, I couldn't reach the controls really well. So in order to see over the machine and reach the controls better, I, was, I stood on a box about eight inches tall, upside down, so I could reach the controls. And I, went, I, was working, I worked 12 hour shifts in this, in this, uh, on this machine every, Every night, for some reason, we worked nights for many, many days. You know, worked at night, and so um, during that period, Schindler had, you know, he was entertaining in his office a lot. His office was upstairs in the factory, 
and we could hear when it was loud enough and when the music was loud enough we could actually hear it down in the factory you know they they were having a party but after the, all the guests left Schindler would come down out of his office down to the factory floor all by himself and walk through slowly walk through the factory and stop and talk to people and sometimes he actually stopped and talked to me you know I was but I was a little kid standing on a box I think he had a, he was amused a little bit about my standing on a box working on this machine but you know he would ask he would you could tell the difference between a man like Schindler and these Nazis who barked these orders at us, never told, you know, there was always barking orders. Single word commands, los, schnell, los, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, Schindler stopped, when he stopped and talked to me, for example, he talked, said good evening or good morning, or whatever time of day it was, and uh, he asked me some questions, and he wanted to know how many pieces or whatever I may I was doing, and uh, I would tell him, and he'd wait for an answer, you know, and uh, it was just a different kind of human being. You could tell the difference. A Nazi would never do that. I know that if, if I brought two people here to this, to this room, and I had a, a real flaming Nazi on one side and a, a Schindler-like person on the other side, you could tell the difference who was who by just looking him in the eyes. You know, when Schindler spoke to me, you could tell a little bit of, a little glimmer of something in his eyes that there's different from what the Nazis were. The Nazis were just blanks. Uh, this, this reminds me that um, uh, we were we were accused about uh, those those of us who were in these camps for not resisting, but that's not true. You know, we all resisted. Everyone resisted. I resisted when I uh, scrounged around and got another piece of bread. Uh, I resisted when uh, I went to. A little room in the, in the back of the building where they were t the teacher was teaching uh, his subject. Um, all of that is, was all resistance, and people, you know, you know, to the Nazis, to the Nazis, we were the Jews who lived in the ghetto. You know, the Jews. But if they could see us with normal eyes. If they looked at us, they could see that in the in the in the ghetto lived all kinds of people from all walks of life. There were artists and professors and uh, doctors and everything that you can imagine. Every profession. There were plumbers and every, gardeners and whatever, but not uh, who were Jewish but not the Jews. So, you know, during that period of time, for example, to go back to the ghetto, and even in camp, you know, people just, you couldn't keep us down. We kept coming up, you know, they were singing songs, people who were uh, in, the opera singers would sing arias, and, you know, and professors would uh, write little notes and stuff, and do their lectures. It was going on all the time. We were trying to keep up our humanity. They were trying to keep us down. We were trying to keep us up, keep it up. But they couldn't keep it, keep us down. They could kill us because they had all the guns. And we had all the women and children, you know. So, but as far as keeping up our spirit and and uh, keeping up our humanity, that's part of resistance. We sang songs, you know, you can't imagine singing songs during a time like that, but we did. Although the, we would change the lyrics from the popular songs with the, and put 
the gallows lyrics to it and he sings songs like the popular Polish song at the time we were singing it and with words that said what a wonderful place the ghetto was it's it's a uh, a real uh, heavenly place most heavenly place on earth this stuff like that um, people told jokes and so maybe I'll tell you one <laughs> just one so during the period of time where these this these people were shooting Jews in the eastern part of Poland uh, with their guns before the the concentrate before the death camps. There was this Nazi who was been doing that for several years now, and he just got kind of bored with it. He wasn't having any more fun. But he was going to had this Jew. He was going to shoot. Then he thought maybe he would enjoy himself. And so he asked the Jew that um, to identify one of his eyes, because one of his eyes was made out of glass by this wonderful German technician, and, and no one could tell the difference between his glass eye and his real eye. But if he could guess which one it was, his glass eye, he'd let him, he'd let him live. You know, 50-50 chance, you know, Jew said, he looked at it, looked at it one eye and the other, and finally pointed to one and said, this one. And he was right. Because you knew that, yeah, he was going to be right. And so here's the punchline. The, the German says, how in the world did you do this? No one ever guessed which one, my, which one of my eyes is glass. How did you find, how did you do that? He said, well, I looked in each one of your eyes, and in one of them I, I noticed a little glimmer of humanity. I knew that was glass. <laughs> so, that kind of stuff. It's all part of, part of the defense, you know. Parts of, part of resistance. And so the, the war was beginning to go badly for the Germans and uh, the Russians were going to be in Krakow soon. And so those people who had factories like Schindler just closed their factories, sent their people back to Plaszow, to the concentration camp, took their money and ran. And it's my sister's company that had sent her back to Plaszow where she ended up. But Schindler decided he was not going to do that. He was going to have his machinery dismantled and have it machinery shipped to the Czechoslovakia, where he came from. He actually came from Sudeten, Germany. And, uh, and then he was going to bring his employees with him. You imagine, it was so far out, so far-fetched that even when I heard it, I said, he's never going to be able to do that. That's never going to happen. But as you know, he did that, you know. And so, but during the period of time that his machinery was being dismantled for shipment, he couldn't keep all his employees. So some of, some of us had to be sent back. Someone made up a list who's going to stay to dismantle the machinery and who's going to leave go back to Plashov. When the list came out, my, my father, my brother, and I were on the list to leave, and my mother was on the list to stay. I don't know how that happened. I don't know who made up the list. I don't know how they figured this out. They had, you know, well, maybe they figured four laces. Well, one lace could stay, and then the other three could go. Something, I don't know. It, it, I hate to speculate on how this, how this happened. But in any case, 
we were already lined up in rows of four, and we escorted out of Schindler's company back to Plashev. And as, as luck would have it, the Nazis had this habit of having a stand when they had to move us from one place to another. We'd line up in rows of four, and then we'd stand there for an hour or maybe more. You know, They would count us, and they would look at the list and check this and that. So we stood there for a long time. And while I was standing there, waiting to be escorted out of Schindler's company, Schindler came to see who was leaving. And he was just came over and he just kind of started walking back and forth in front of the group, from one end to the other. And because I was little and I never lined up in the rows of four in front when, whenever we had to line up, I always lined up in the, in the back row so I would not be conspicuous. But this time I wanted to be someplace where I could get Schindler's attention, but I couldn't couldn't get his attention because I was little and I was in the back and he was walking back and forth and so I thought when I would move out of my row to the end of the group, so when he got to that end, I could get his attention. While I was doing that, a guard saw me, hit me with his rifle butt, and um in addition to, to hitting me with the rifle, but I had a, a thermos bottle, one of those old-fashioned kind of thermos bottles. I had water in it. My friend who lived with us in the ghetto gave that to me when he was, before he was shipped out to the death camps, he and his wife. I said, you keep this. Anyway, I had water in it, and the guy hit me, and it broke that bottle. And it made the popping noise like... Uh, when you break a, a light bulb or something, you know. And so everybody's attention was in my direction, and Schindler looked, and I called out to him that my father and my brother and I are being sent away. He got us out of, he ordered us out of that group immediately. And he told us to go join the group that was staying in another location in the factory. He saved our lives at that point. If he had not, we had ended up uh, in pla back in Plashev, where most people who were sent back ended up in places like Buchenwald, where we were carrying rocks up and down the side of the uh, hillside. We would not have survived the war. So he saved our lives right there. And it was a wonderful thing. And you think that's great. But I have to tell you something that he did that will give you a better idea of what kind of a human being he, this man was. Once he ordered us out of that group and told us to go join the other group that was staying, he got to the other group first, where my mother was. She was on the list to stay. He found my mother there and told her not to worry that we were coming back. Yeah, it's pretty good, right? Wow. That's what we call today, I guess, with the beyond the call of duty. But uh, this is something that really give you an idea of how what kind of a human being he was, and the, and how his mind worked. He just simply thought there's this woman who's probably worried about her husband and the two children leaving, I better go tell her not to worry. And we were going to be there next next 15 minutes or something, but he got there first and told her. My mother told me this, and she said, when he came over and told me that you were coming back, I didn't believe him. I mean, this is really far-fetched, you know, when you think about it that he would do a thing like that. But that's the kind of human being he was. She said, I didn't believe him. That was interesting. In any case, he did many unbelievable things. You know, he spent most of his fortune to do what he was doing. Uh, and he saved 1,200 people. Uh, 
which was no small thing to save 1,200 people. But when, when you think about uh, the number of people that are alive today because of Shin what Schindler had a accomplished during that time, it's enormous. And so um, we were all sent afterwards, after the machinery was uh, finally dismantled, we all were sent back to Pla to Plashuf to be awaiting to be transferred to uh, Schindler's new location. And the men went first in the transport, and uh, so my my father, my brother, and I left. And my sister and my mother, who were in Plashov, my mother was in the, on the list, but my, my sister had been sent back from her company, and so my father asked uh, Schindler to ask my sister to the women's list, and he did that too. So as you know, when the women were uh, sent, at, you know, if you saw the movie, how many of you have seen the movie? Yeah, quite a few of you have seen the movie. Well, you know that um, when um, he found, Schindler found out that not all the women were on his list were being sent back, he went and, in the city, you know, he went and spent a lot, a lot more of his money and insisted that all the women on his list be sent back. Because when the women were uh, on the way to Schindler's company, they were diverted to Auschwitz. And there in Auschwitz, there was standard procedure. Uh, people would come in, and there was a man standing there who would point to the left or the right as people approached him, and some people who were to the left to die and the people to the right to live. That's, that was the thing. And so when my, my sister and my mother approached this man, my sister being 17 years old, young woman, strong, so he sent her to live, my mother to die, just worthless already. And so she was already in the barracks awaiting the gas chamber. When Schindler found out that not all the women were being sent to him to his fa new factory, he went and spent some more money. At that point, my mother was taken out of the barracks where she was awaiting the gas chamber and brought back and joined the women who ended up on Schindler's list. That's a just one of the things that he did that that it's you know tells you about what kind of a human being he was, but you also have to remember that he did this at a time when the law of the land was to murder Jews, not to save them. To save a Jew was against the law. You could end up in a concentration camp yourself. So he ended up in trouble many a times himself, you know, for doing this. But he had, you know, he had so many friends. He was entertaining so many people, and he was, he was able to, you know, he was fast talker. And uh, he was able to persuade him, and with a lot of bribes. Of course, he kept spending more and more of his money. You know, I should tell you that uh, just one item about him. When he um, he went to rescue his accountant, you know, when you in the movie. It, it shows that his accountant was taken on this one trip, you know, on a transport, and he went to rescue him. So went to, he went through the different uh, uh, railroad cars and looked and found Stern. They looked for Stern and found Stern, and Stern, he got, Schindler got him off the train, and Stern survived with us on Schindler's list. 
But in the movie, if you saw the movie, you didn't see that. I mean, the movie can't show you everything. When he was looking for his accountant, he saw my then second oldest brother. And he was there with his girlfriend. When Shindra saw him there, he offered to get him off the train. My, my, bro my brother declined to get off his, because he, he was the, with her and and so he decided to stay with her instead. That was the last decision he made. They both ended up in Belzitz in the death camp at the end of the line. He was my big brother, age 17, you know, I was not going to tell you about that, but I had to, you know, I, I always find it very hard to, to do that, so, but I, I thought maybe I, I should. These Nazis did not murder numbers, they murdered individuals. Like my brother, who was a talented young man, 17 years old, he, you know, it's too sad. But anyway, we ended up, we all ended up in Schindler's uh, new location. And the women came later. They were, you know, what you saw, in the, if you saw the movie, how they were treated in, the, in, the, uh, in Auschwitz. This is how we were treated because we also went through another camp called Gross Rosen. We were treated about the same way. In any case, uh, there we were in Schindler's company, the last eight months of the, of the war. We were pretty well worn out, pretty well exhausted, you know, physically and, and uh, mentally. And, uh, you know, the last few months, they were the hardest, actually. But Schindler had the same habit. At night, when everybody left, he would come over and walk through the new factory and stop and talk to people. And he kept stop talking to me too, many times. One time during that period, he stopped and actually talked to me for a little while. And um, usually, he would call me up, call me to his office, and give me a little piece of bread. But this time, he just talked to me, and then he walked away. I went to talk to somebody else. And, to my brother and my father and so on. And that was at night. He saw me working at night there. So the next day when I went to work, I found out that Schindler left word that I should not be working nights anymore. That's pretty good. I don't know how he, how he, he, he knew this, but you know, I was getting a little blurry eyed uh, uh, working these 12, 12 hour shifts at night all the time, especially in the end, towards the end of the, end of the war, we were running out of steam, everybody was pretty well exhausted, and I was getting a little blurry eyed every now and then. But I don't know how he, he know, maybe he saw something or, or just thought this kid shouldn't be working nights. And so I got to work days all the time, the rest of the time. And I don't mind telling you, there was some jealousy about among the other employees, you know, saying, we, you know, we had to work nights, uh, why not you? I said, well, I don't know what to tell you, the Schindler's orders. <laughs> <laughs> and so the war was winding down, and we were winding down as well. And so, towards the end of the war, uh, a few months before the war was over, the guards were beginning to run for their lives, you know, they, they would abandon the, the warehouses, and so Shinda got a, a truck and gets, got some people on the truck, and he went out there in one of those warehouses and then brought back to, uh, to the camp hundreds of bolts of cloth in this truck. 
and hundreds of bottles of vodka. <laughs> Brought it all to the camp. And he left word, you know, that uh, everyone who leaves the camp should receive a bolt of cloth and a bottle of vodka. You, you don't, you can't imagine what a prescient thing that was to do. To understand that when we leave the camp, we are leaving with nothing, and we ended up going to nothing. Um, we didn't have anything waiting for us when we got there. But he gave us a bolt of cloth and a bottle of vodka, and you would be amazed what a wonderful thing that was. But we got, you know, in our family, we had five bottles of vodka and five <laughs> <laughs> bolts of cloth. Well, we could barter for vodka. You could get all kinds of things. You know, you get a place to stay. You could you know, trade it for for other things. And so for a while there, we just kept trading our uh, what we had. My first uh, pair of trousers were made out of navy blue. You know, one of the bolts of cloth and. Uh, we gave the rest of the bolt of cloth to the tailor who was did the tailoring. So I ended up with navy blue pants. I should should have kept them because they probably wouldn't have fit. <laughs> and so we came to Krakow, and uh, my my father got his pre-war job. Actually, went back to the factory where he worked before the war and. We thought maybe we could establish ourselves in, back in Krakow, but that was not going to happen. You can't go back. Um, in our case, we had nothing to go back to. We had no place to live, we had to uh, rent something, so actually we, we got a place to, to share with three other families, you know. And, um, and my father's work was so so. You know, we all had to do something. We all had to work to, to in order to uh, make make you know make a living. And so uh, we decided that maybe uh, we would be better off to settle in Czechoslovakia or something. You know. So my brother, my sister. And I went to Czechoslovakia to find out what it was like there. Well, you know, my mother looked around the house and she realized that she started out with five children and suddenly she didn't have any. So she decided to, you know, she put up a fuss and decided that she, she should have at least one, you know. So I had to come back. I went, you know, being the youngest. I came back and back to Krakow, and uh, my brother and sister ended up in Czechoslovakia for a little while, and then uh, joined a group that was le going to Israel, and they both went to Israel from there, where they live today. They have large families. My my sister's a great grandmother, and uh, so on. We, uh, my father, my mother and I were in Krakow for the rest of that year and then decided it's time to leave. It was not a good place for us to be. and uh, So we joined a group that was smuggling people out of, out of Poland and we ended up in Germany in a displaced persons camp, the three of us. And um, during that period, we were there. We were there for two years. So and during that period of time, uh, we gave the we submitted our names to organizations that did family searching, and they. We told them we had somebody who lived in the United States. So they, when they asked us where in the United States, and they, we said, "Well, we don't know, New York. Everybody lives in New York, right?" <laughs> But for some way, they, they found somebody and told them that, uh, of course, my relatives who lived in this country since the 19, early 1900s already discovered what happened to their families in Poland. 
And so they realized that everyone had perished except uh, one day somebody came told them that um, there's somebody in the displaced persons camp that might be related to them. So they wrote to us and it turned out to be my mother's brother and my mother's sister. And they proceeded to bring us over to this country. So in 1949, it took several years before it was, we were, they were able to accomplish that. And um, in 1949, we came to this country. Landed in Boston. And I must tell you, the minute I stepped on this American soil, I knew I was someplace different and some, something different from any place where I've been before. People were smiling and they were helpful. They wanted to know if I needed help. They, they were just, it was just different. This country is different. You have to be from someplace else to know how great this country is. And so I, I, I just knew it. There was something in the air that was just different. And so our relatives lived in Los Angeles. And uh, we landed in Boston. So we had to take a train from Boston to New York, New York to Chicago, Chicago to Los Angeles. It's a long trip on the train. They gave us money to spend for food, and so we, we would go to the... A dining car and point at something. Not, not, we didn't have a word of English among us, you know, the three of us, we didn't have a word of English. So, so we spoke this strange language and we sat there and people around us knew that we were these refugees, you know. And uh, we went to the dining car, I, we would point to something and then they'd give us something and then they'd say how much it was and I was the cashier, so uh, I would take out a large enough bill, I think, that would cover it. Then they would give me change. And next time I went, they got <laughs> took out another large bill because I didn't understand what they said. And so uh, it was too embarrassing not to know. And, and so anyway, I ended up with a lot of change in my pocket, <laughs> to say the least. So I was sitting there, and it was a long trip. I was looking at the coins to see what shape they are. You know, I could read the numbers, you know, I could read. 10 and 5 and so on, not a problem, but you know, when you're in a foreign country, you want to see what, how, how large the coins are and how, what shape they are and so on. So I was doing that, and a woman who was sitting next to us, and she knew that we were these foreigners, I mean, really speaking that strange language, dressed this way, she came over and said, and, got out of her seat and sat next to me, and she took a coin out of my hand and lifted up and said, this is a nickel, and then, then this is a penny, this is a dime, like that. You know, once she was finished, she went back and sat down, and that was it. She didn't think she did anything, anything great, you know, just, she did that. It was a normal thing for an American lady to do. And so she probably didn't remember that the day, the next day, or the day after. But it's been 60 years, and I'll never forget that woman. It was something different. She did that, she did that automatically without waiting to be thanked for it. She didn't think she did a great thing. She just did, just, just something that she did. A small kindness. A small kindness goes a long way, as you can see. And 60 years later, I still remember that woman. She does not remember me, I'm sure. And so, this is how it went for me for the rest of my time in this country. Uh, we finally ended up in... Um, Los Angeles. You know, while I was in this this uh, DP camp, I had uh, you know I was a kid still, I'm 
So somebody gave me a hat, kind of like a Dick Tracy hat. So I wore that for the whole two years I was there, four years I mean. I wore my hat. I still had my hat uh, when I when we the train stopped in Los Angeles. It was time for us to get off. I took my hat and put it up on the luggage rack and turned around and came out into the California sunshine. And uh, my uncle waited for us uh, in his with his car to pick us up. And everything else after that is history. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening. I want you to know that I'm not here by myself. I have my family here. They're all here to support me, just in case I need, I need support. There's Brian, and Tyler, and Nick, my grandchildren. My daughter is here, their mother. Hiding someplace, yeah, oh, hi, hi. Yeah, I want you to know that I'm not here by myself. I have a lot of support. I forgot to introduce my wife. She's just as happy that I didn't do that. She <laughs> I, met, I met her at my school. I was teaching, minding my own business, and then this lady came to, to teach and uh, she was going to just stay one semester and go on someplace else. And, uh, but at the end of that semester, we were married. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a great ride. So uh, if I understand that we have a period of time, you, you want to ask some questions. I don't know how we're doing time-wise. Somebody should tell me that. I never know how long I'm speaking. It's a, is we it have, time? We have time for a few. We have time for a few questions. Yeah, we have. Huh? Okay. Okay. So, if anyone has, has questions, just raise your hand, and Elaine or I will come with the microphone. Um, we are recording tonight, so Elaine and I will hold on to the microphones. Make sure we get proper mic placement, so that you're well heard on the recording. Anybody have a question? Uh, Mr. Lyson, at what point in your life did you begin to share your story with your children? How old were they when you decided to start sharing that? Uh, my children find, found out about me um, gradually. Um, the older they got, the more they found out. Um, I never, never burdened our kids with my experiences. As a matter of fact, I never spoke about my experiences to anybody other than my immediate family anywhere, any place. So even for the 35 years in, at school, at my job, uh, people didn't know I was not from here. Except once in a while they, they notice an accent. But, but I would always, they would always ask me uh, where I was from, and I would always say, I'm from the East. And they, <laughs> they accepted that, you know, that was it. <laughs> so, as a, to answer your question, um, gradually, the older they got, the more they knew. Mr. Lason, how did you feel when you watched your story being told by Steven Spielberg in the, in the movie Schindler's List? In the movie Schindler's List. Um, as far as the uh, events were concerned, they were depicted quite accurately. It's just, it's just we just don't know what they said to each other during 
those uh, exchanges. But um, it was obviously well done, and, and it's uh, um, a credit to Spielberg that he, he waited th that long, you know, it's 10 years after the book came out, and so on. So um, he didn't tell exactly my story, but it's close. You know, you can never tell the, in a movie everything. As a matter of fact, um, you know, you couldn't tell about my brother staying on the train with his girlfriend, and he left a lot of stuff out. But in a movie, that's like I said, you can't, you can't sh tell everything. You know, we, we were invited when the movie came, first came out. Uh, people like me who were on the list were invited to come, come to see it. So we came and saw it, and, and then, uh, when it was over, we were walking out and, uh, uh, out of the theater, and uh, there were some people standing there, and, and they wanted to know what we thought of the movie and stuff. And so I, w I was walking with uh, a woman next to me, and uh, they said, how, how was it? The, movie, the, the woman said, the real thing lasted much longer. <laughs> That's about it. You can't, you can't show everything in a movie. But it was well done, obviously. Mr. Lason, I have a question for you over here. On this side. <laughs> I can never tell where the sound is coming right. from. <laughs> over here. From over there. Oh my goodness, I'm a little nervous. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing your, I get you're very nervous. emotional. I'm, I'm um, standing up here, you can't <laughs> be nervous. <laughs> thank you for sharing such a personal story with all of us. It was, it, you're, you're an extraordinary person, I have to say. And I have to ask you, um, where did you draw your strength and your courage on a daily basis to survive what you survived? I mean, because it's pretty much a miracle in my eyes after, you know, what you said. And um, I'm just, you know, that's my question. <laughs> well, I, I had a little, uh, little advantage in that. I had my parents, you know, I, um, it was easier for me because my parents were still there. Even though they couldn't do anything for me, but they were still there. Even the, during the time of the, when we were in a, camp, in a concentration camp and, and uh, my, my mother was in the, on the women's side and my father was in another barrack and I was in another barrack, we were all separated. And uh, even though we were separated, they, they, I knew they were there, it made, made a difference. Maybe one more, and if there's someone among the younger set who'd like to ask a question, um, I'm sure your perspective would be appreciated. <laughs> okay. Yes, there's one over here. Did you ever find out what happened to the other kids in the ghetto that um, decided to hide? They did not survive the war. Have you m met Schindler since that time? Have yes, I have. Mm -hmm. what, was that? what was that like? <laughs> he, he came to, you know, he traveled quite a bit. He, after the war, he didn't, he didn't do very well. In, in Germany, he couldn't do business with, in Germany because the Germans wouldn't do business with him. And uh, so he traveled and then he ended up in uh, traveling to Israel quite a bit, where most of the people who survived on his list were living. And he also came to Los Angeles. He came to Los Angeles in 1965. Uh, by that time, I was working at Huntington Park High School uh, I was married as a grown man, and so uh, 
when it was time to, uh, you know, when he got off the, tr the um, um, plane, uh, he came out and people who came to greet him who were older than I, I thought should go first. And so they went first and said hi to him. It was my turn. I thought maybe I better introduce myself. You know, I was, I was almost as tall as he was. He looked at me and said, I know who you are. You're a little lason. <laughs> yeah. So, and then um, we spoke for a, for a little bit when we, were, we went to this uh, man's home. As a matter of fact, it was the person who actually was instrumental in getting the movie made. And uh, we spoke for a while, and he asked me what I was doing, and and I told him, and he thought I, that was pretty good. Because um, I told him I was a, a industrial arts teacher, but in, in German, when you say it in German, it's, uh, it sounds more elevated, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you may say you are, you're a Fachlehrer. Oh, it's, it's different, you know. <laughs> Anyway, he shook his head, you know, it's kind of as if that was okay, as if he had something to do with it, which he did. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, we're very glad to have had something to do with uh, your coming here this evening. Um, so th thank you all, and we hope to see you again at some point. Um, I don't know if there are any closing remarks um, that are coming from Rose Hills Foundation or... No? Okay, then uh, thank you all for coming, um, and again, we do hope to see you again.